Greetings, fellow travelers. My name is Will DeWitt, and in this brief slideshow, which I hope will help you as you assemble information for your paper next week, um, I'll be discussing the fourth intermezzo from Brahms Opus 118, and basically provide a general discussion of my own observations. Uh, this work, in my opinion, strongly resembles ternary form, sonata form even. Um, this graphic kind of provides an overview uh, from a second reading perspective of the major structural delineations in the overarching harmonic movement from F minor, which is truly the home key, uh, to F major, uh, which occurs right at the end in the coda. Sandwiched in between the two A sections is a very interesting B section, which I won't discuss in detail here, uh, but it also shares many of the characteristics, uh, many of the same devices that Brahms uses uh, at the beginning and the closing section. What we're going to see here as we move on is that Brahms is very good at exploiting, just as his romantic counterparts were, uh, exploiting the use of rhythmic consonants and rhythmic dissonance. Uh, and he does it in a manner that's not unlike the way he manipulates harmony. Uh, as has been noted by others earlier, uh, these two things go together hand in hand. What immediately jumps out in the first thematic area is the obvious use of counterpoint between the left and the right hands. Uh, as you look at the first eight measures, which are not all pictured here uh, for space considerations, we essentially see that a canon is formed with the upper voice of the left hand imitating at the interval of an octave, the upper voice of the right hand. You may note the, the brown colored arrows and uh, notes there. The metric displacement that you see here equals one beat, and that remains the case throughout, wherever the canon appears or reappears. And layered, um, layered alongside, the same canon-like phenomena occurs in the lower voices of the treble and bass as well. In other words, the alto and the bass voices tend to have the same symmetry. Uh, it's quite interesting that Brahms opted for this, this historical device to function as the template or the backdrop for his romantic composition. I think his use of counterpoint is more than just, you know, a, a nod to the past, however. Uh, Brahms' movement between passages of rhythmic consonants and rhythmic dissonance, such as the, um, the three-on-two hemiolas that are pictured here, and the earlier uh, metric displacements that were the result of, of the canon, um, you know, the movement between the consonants and the dissonance is actually facilitated by this tension, this underlying tension that, that's created naturally by counterpoint. As indicated here, the metric tension and release plays a role uh, in the usage of harmonic consonants and harmonic dissonance as well. You'll note here that in measure... 23, uh, the duplet-triplet tension uh, resolves the downbeat of measure 23 at the same point that cadential resolution is, re is, is, is achieved.
from just this first page, many examples of metric dissonance can be heard and seen. I like this recording uh, below um, of an Israeli pianist, uh, and you can hear many, many examples beyond those that I've mentioned of metric dissonance. Uh, if the link doesn't work or if you're not able to view it, I'll post I'll post it separately in the uh, thread that accompanies this. can be noted here that from a harmonic perspective, you know, Brahms is uh, rather fond of the German augmented sixth, and these occur at key transition points, which mark the final approaches to both uh, A sections. In the first example on the left, C flat forms the augmented interval, and in the second, in measure 20, 123, the expected B natural spelling uh, occurs here and that also creates obviously the German augmented six again both facilitate and set the stage harmonically for a move uh, to the tonic with the latter actually facilitating a final move to the parallel major F major at the coda And some final observations here. Um, you know, the harmonic and rhythmic devices Brahms employed in this intermezzo add an element of difficulty uh, for the performer. I don't see it as a difficulty that is technical, but one that is interpretive. I've listened to about five different performance recordings of this intermezzo, and each one varies significantly from the others in terms of how and where the pianist chooses to emphasize or de-emphasize the tensions that are created by a rhythmic and harmonic dissonance. If Jenny Cassin's recording, um, which is linked here as well, matches my own interpretation more closely than the others, because he doesn't seem to hide from or attempt to unnecessarily minimize the rhythmic tension created by the left hand. By highlighting the conflict between hands, a more emotional response is generated and creates an even more powerful sense of denouement or rest uh, over, the, over the final four or five measures, the coda. And finally, uh, melodic continuity you know, is certainly at times difficult to detect in some performers' interpretations. Uh, I think that's because of Brahms' purposefully obscured treatment of melody and accompaniment. The B section, which covers measures 52 to 99, which is another double canon, by the way, is one of several places where this is a potential challenge for the pianist. In the end, however, melodic concerns, I think, are rightly considered of secondary importance, as the musical effect that Brahm probably intended depends more upon the aforementioned elements of rhythm, canon, metric and harmonic dissonance, etc., than it does uh, upon traditional notions of melody and accompaniment. I hope this has been helpful.